Hoffman and Dr. Corey Sheedy. I'm going to read their bios. Alexa leads implementation of the Conrad N. Hilton Foundation's Youth Substance Use Prevention and Early Intervention Initiative. Previously, she served for three years as Substance Abuse Program Director with the Council of State Governments Justice Center in Bethesda, Maryland, where she was responsible for advising governmental and non-governmental agencies on developing and implementing substance abuse treatment and other rehabilitative services for individuals in the criminal justice system. Our second speaker on today's webinar is Dr. Corey Sheedy. Dr. Sheedy is a senior associate at ABT Associates. She has more than 15 years of experience managing, directing, and conducting research, evaluation, training, and technical assistance and communication projects, particularly in the behavioral health prevention, treatment, and recovery fields. She is currently directing a three-year project evaluating the Conrad N. Hilton Foundation Substance Use Prevention and Early Intervention Strategic Initiative focused on ESPER programs for youth and young adults. For SAMHSA, she served as a project director for SAMHSA's Recovery Month project for nine years, where she directed, managed, and oversaw all aspects of this multifaceted project. Co-wrote a paper on the Medicaid coverage of ESPERT, including discussing results of a national survey and case studies. She also serves as a coach in SAMHSA's Behavioral Health Leadership Development Program. Okay, now at this time, I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Eggleston and Dr. Sheedy, if you guys are ready. Excellent. Thanks so much. Um, and this is Alexa Eggleston. Um, I'm happy to be with you all today and um, want to take the time to just thank you all for joining us. Uh, so the Conrad Hilton Foundation um, was founded by Conrad Hilton to improve the lives of disadvantaged and vulnerable people in the world. I really want to encourage everyone on the phone or on the webinar today to visit our website, learn more about the uh, range of work that we do. Um, today I'm going to be talking about one of our uh, strategic initiatives that is focused on prevention and early intervention. Um, that initiative um, was launched in 2013 um, and is aimed at preventing and reducing substance use for adolescent population, which we really define as uh, mid to late adolescents into early 15 to 22 year olds utilizing a public health approach called ESPERT or Screening, Grief, Intervention, and Referral to Treatment. So my job for the next uh, few minutes is to spend a little bit of time talking about the big picture of the work that the foundation is involved in, what we hope to accomplish, and then I'll be turning it over to Dr. Sheedy, who will be uh, digging in a little bit deeper to talk about the uh, learning and evaluation work that we will be doing. Um, so first I want to talk just a little bit about um, some of the activities that were happening in the field that really led to the foundation's uh, particular interest in screening and early intervention activities. Uh, so what you see in front of you is guidance that was issued by the American Academy of Pediatrics in 2011, uh, really focusing on the role that pediatricians can play forward in looking at you know, the range of that affect young and adolescents. And I think this document was particularly important because it really served as a call to action um, to the people, people uh, as a whole to really think about you know, they, how they could be strengthening their work around um, substance use disorders. Um, they recently released uh, an report, a report on binge drinking and role and you have not encourage you to pull that up. Um, another uh, sort of document or think piece that's been released in the last uh, year or two uh, are principles from the National Institute on Drug Abuse, and it just really emphasizes that uh, you know I think increasingly uh, leadership within the substance use disorder and addiction field is really calling for more emphasis on. Uh, the need to really be thinking about the front end of the continuum and how we really have our strategies that look upstream. These are just three of the, um, I think, 14 principles that are outlined in that stuff. And again, we'll see that on the work that we're doing at the foundation that um, we finally figured out how we do a better job of identifying these as early as possible. Uh, 
there are other points that, that we can intervene um, throughout that that medical visits in general opportunity in terms of conversations around alcohol and drug use. Um, this is a slide I think that just reiterates or emphasizes the interest that does exist within a lot of pediatricians to uh, better information and have the skill sets, particularly as it relates to education of health and substance use disorders. Um, so this piece of this I think is something that, you know, as you pediatricians uh, for the most part have some level of thinking about um, to a better job and going into practice. Or uh, a little bit of a conversation at least about um, how we intervene and attack that substance. You know, I think it's the day just the fact that they recognize part of their uh, role is really important. And I think something that we need to think about how we respond to, um, particularly in the sort of, uh, new uh, healthcare environment that's really focusing more and more on uh, how we do a better job of linking healthcare with substance use and mental health services. Uh, the other thing or, or, or has been oh, me, um, has been percolating over the, the last couple of years uh, is the work that's been happening in the school-based health uh, center movement um, across the country. And you know, obviously pediatricians in your traditional primary care settings aren't the only um, setting or place where we need to be thinking about those issues. And so this slide is, is just an excerpt from one of the um, regular reports that they do around the activities of school-based health clinics. And, and as you can see, uh, there is a decent level of activities that's happening in school-based health clinics. And so I think it just represents um, another opportunity to really think about our increasing access to care for adolescents. I mean, in particular, about how we strengthen and expand existing systems like school-based health clinics um, that are um, providing substance use and mental health services. Um, so, as the foundation and staff, foundation staff and board uh, begin to think about uh, what new opportunities there may be to uh, really invest in work that was strength of uh, substance use disorders, uh, they spend a lot of time talking to them to go. Um, they hire an external consulting agency. Um, and, you know, as they talk to people, they recognize that there are, there are these different areas that, um, that provide opportunities for investment. The foundation's history had been very focused on primary prevention and the development of a school-based prevention curriculum um, for the past 20-plus uh, years, and the board is really interested in what new opportunities existed uh, to really advance thinking around substance use disorders. Uh, as part of that process, as I mentioned, we talked to a number of practitioners, researchers, experts in the field, um, and you know, really I think identified, as you can see on this slide, a number of opportunities again across that continuum to really think about um, how the Hilton Foundation in particular can impact and really think about, you know, there are the gaps that exist and, and the areas where there isn't as much emphasis. And, um, as a result of the process, which took you know over a year, it, I think re-emphasized or emphasized that um, one of the areas that was not not getting much attention was uh, the prevention world, and in particular that early intervention space that really spans the prevention and 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 treatment and the continuum. Um, and I think that is uh, one of the reasons why the expert. Uh, Approach really resonated um, with the board in particular. I'm going to assume most people here are uh, familiar with, you know, what ESPERT is. Um, the slide that you see in front of you is uh, actually a slide that's several years old. It comes from that initial uh, set of activities and work that the foundation did to really uh, think about the direction that they wanted to go in. And so, of course, you know, ESPERT is a public health approach that really um, provides an important opportunity to think about um, identifying risky use and, and trying to do what we can to address that. Um, but of course, you know, because we're talking about an adolescent population, also um, very focused on thinking about what that primary prevention message is that's delivered. And of course, for that, uh, 
people that are going to need a referral to specialty services, really trying to get smarter and more strategic about how we make those linkages. The other thing I want to say about expert in particular and, and why it resonated with the board, um, in particular for an adolescent population, given that the research is, is newer, obviously, than the adolescent phase, I think it presents sort of four really important opportunities to advance poly and, uh, policy and practice at a higher level. So obviously, kind of, uh, the identifying young people who may have more risk factors or higher risk at um, developing substance use disorders. Um, I think we want to obviously be more thoughtful about how we do early intervention and we have more opportunities, again, across that continuum to intervene as early as possible for young people. Um, of course, and I think one of the things perhaps that, perhaps that resonated most was that it really provided an opportunity to address substance use as an issue. And I think one of the things the board talked and talked a lot about in the context of the strategy development was the progress that we're making in advancing um, health and public health strategy to address addiction. And that ESPER provided a really um, interesting, innovative, excited opportunity opportunity to um, really engage the healthcare community um, in conversations, in activities, in a range of strategies to um, continue to make sure that we are moving in that direction. And finally, I think um, the issue of reducing stigma and really wanting to, at the end of the day, um, have substance use addressed like we address any other health factor uh, for young people in particular. And so really needing to think about the need out there, and I'll talk a little bit more about it later, for um, continued broader education about what we know about substance use disorder, what we know about addiction in particular, um, and how we can do a better job of providing more information um, to help combat some of the stigma uh, that, that you might be experiencing substance use disorders. So the approach, uh, another Hello, it looks like we just lost our audio for Alexa. If you could just give us one moment, we're going to get her back up and running. I've just unmuted you. Would you like to jump in while we're uh, waiting for Alexa to come back on? Sure. I don't have Alexa speaking notes, but I can talk uh, through the next couple of slides that she's developed. Um, through the Hilton Foundation's strategic initiative, they've created an infographic which Alexa has parsed out into the next several slides. Um, as you know, you know, screening, brief intervention, referral to treatment is a proven and practical approach to meet um, youth and young adults where they are in the continuum as well as where they're receiving services. Um, so as evidenced by this um, infographic presented on the slide, a qualified medical professional, school, or other youth professional talks with the young person and asks questions. And then this screening reveals any alcohol or drug use, and a response um, is tailored to meet the needs of the situation and tailored to the, situa and tailored to the individual. So the assessment part it assesses use and risk, and then you could be triage as none, moderate, and high. You advise just the individual to avoid, stop, or reduce substance use or other risky behaviors. Um, and then based on the, the screening assessment, you affirm the decision to not use as a you know, positive affirmation of their behavior. You engage them in a conversation to motivate positive change, or you refer to treatment. Again, this is very dependent on the 
the screening results um, an individual and particular youth have. This uh, for youth, the 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 expert quote unquote model um, is perhaps a little different than than it exists for adults because it is it is a lot of a conversation with the kid as well as with their um, parent and family member if necessary or if warranted. Uh, Sarah, can you advance the next slide? I don't think I have Actually, access. Corey, it looks like we have Alexa back on, so I'm just going to bring her back and just test her audio really quick. Alexa, yes, I am back. Us? Yes, thank you so much. Good job, Corey. I was listening in. <laughs> my apologies. I hope I punted okay. <laughs> you did good. <laughs> Um, apologies for that. My call was dropped. Uh, technology is a, a wonderful thing. <laughs> okay, so once I have the slides back, we can keep rolling. There we go. Um, one of the things I think is, as Corey was mentioning, this uh, these visuals all stem from an infographic that we tried to do that we did to try to respond to. Uh, you know, I think some of the that we still see around general education, around substance use disorders, uh, the importance of on young people. And, you know, I think, too, it really emphasizes Hi, Alexa. It looks like you just cut out on us again. Let me know if you can hear us. Corey, I can see that Alexa's audio was just dropped. She... All right, we'll just give her a minute, if you don't mind. Sure. I'm going to take over the slides here. That way I can pass back and forth between the two of you. And again, we apologize to everyone in the audience. Um, sometimes technical difficulties happen. We're just going to give Alexa one more minute, um, and if we can't get her audio back, uh, Corey, would you like to proceed with your portion of the presentation, and then if Alexa comes back on, we can switch back? Sounds good. Just going to give her one more minute. She did just send us a chat saying she was picking back up. And for everyone in the audience, we do record the sessions. And when we record them, we've generally found that the audio is much better on the recording than it is live. Um, and everyone will receive a link to access that recording. Hi, this is Alexa. I'm back again. Hi, Alexa. No problem. My apologies. Uh, okay, let's try and get through this. Um, so as I was saying... Oh. Sorry, Alexa, I'm just going to hold on to the slides for now, so just tell me when to proceed forward with the next slide. Okay, great. So um, as I was saying just with this slide, um, you know, I think one of the things that we really hope to be able to dig into a little bit through the range of the projects we're funding and obviously in partnership with SAMHSA and NIDA and NIAAA is really to, um, you know, I think have more strategic and thoughtful conversations with young people about what is going on in their lives um, that's contributing to the alcohol and drug use. And again, really um, understanding um, how we can uh, generate additional learning in that space and really how it impacts um, what that trajectory look like, looks like and, and whether it progresses to more serious and harmful use and, and what, what seems to contribute to that. Um, okay, next slide. 
Um, I think another opportunity that is exciting to think about is the uh, need to really think across the continuum and, and in terms of how we can be doing work with, you know, very young children up to young adults. Um, of course, our work really focuses on that, that middle age range of adolescents um, and, and into young adults a bit, but I think there's you know, obvious opportunities given all our conversations right now around adverse childhood experiences and childhood trauma to really look um, as well into, you know, very young people, as I said, zero to five. There's a lot of interest in that space right now um, in terms of, you know, just generally as I'm sure people are aware. But again, to really think about, too, as, um, as young people transition into college and other uh, workforce opportunities, you know, how do we uh, have work that really spans the continuum? Uh, next slide. Um, I think another opportunity, um, and at the end of the day, one of the things we um I spend a lot of time talking and thinking about is how we really minimize the missed opportunities uh, to identify early years. Um, obviously, we know that um, that uh, there is sort of a pathway or a, a you know a, a sort of time period for which is um, represented that young person's life. And so again, how we um, really use these, these events or, or things and those opportunities to really again, engage that young person um, in questions. You know, I think we hear a lot from young people in recovery, um, but you know, a range of young people that, um, that a lot of practitioners aren't answering, asking these questions. And at the end of the day, they think they should be. Um, in the state interesting serving down of young people. And while they it's an embarrassing or hard conversation to have, they do think it should be the responsibility of healthcare practitioners to be asking these sets of questions then um, as they ask, you know, just they ask things around, you know, nutrition and obesity how much sleep you get and, you know, issues around, um, you know, sexual behavior. I think those are all, you know, part of this comprehensive set of services that the young people need to receive as part of routine adolescent care. Uh, next slide. And so the goals, the, the 10,000 foot level of the foundation are to really work that we're doing are to expand education and training um, really around substance use disorders disorders as a whole, um, but in particular around screening and, and our investing resourcing implementation. So not just looking at the training piece, but what does it really take to implement um, these approaches to change practice at the end of the day um, is something we're trying to do and, and the goal of the webinar indicates really change at the end of the day as well. Um, and finally, how do we than disseminate knowledge. You know, again, obviously our budget pales in comparison to what agencies have, but we are um, trying to be very thoughtful and strategic about how we can help fill those gaps um, in this particular space and partner with federal government, but state agencies, there's really not just develop the knowledge and learning that's necessary, um, but help disseminate that. And that's what Corey is going to be spending um, a lot more time talking about at the tail end of the presentation. Uh, next slide. So in terms of the type of work that we're doing, um, you can see from the map at this point, I think we're funding a um, uh, level uh, work at some level in about 30 or more states across the country. Um, and I think one of the interesting things, hopefully, uh, to, to folks on the phone is that First, as I mentioned at the outset, we're you know, thinking about primary health care, thinking about pediatricians and, and that world of practitioners, but I think have been I'm very conscious of the fact from the outset that, um, that a lot of young people don't move through those primary care systems or move through them in a regular way. And so really needing to think about how we reach as many young people as popular, and in particular young people um, that may have more barriers to care or have um, you know, are more likely to have some of the, the challenges or issues that we know may contribute to early substance use. And so as I mentioned, thinking and looking at the role of schools and school-based health clinics in particular, um, thinking about the juvenile justice system and what opportunities there may be through diversion to really strengthen screening and early intervention approaches, and find for funding work that, um, that you know, I guess fit in uh, 
regional settings. And so on looking at working with people more in health services to make sure skills. Um, I think looking at regular community based providers um, is one of the parts that does work for people that are not in the education center system. And then have a lot of challenges. Hi, Alexa. It sounds like we just lost you again on the audio. Corey, while she is uh, coming back on with audio to complete her portion, she has about two slides left. We do have two questions that have come in. Would you mind if I uh, read them aloud and you could take a stab at answering them? Uh, sure. Okay, so the first question is, do you have any data on expert brief interventions in mental health settings? Great question. Uh, one of the Hilton Foundation's grantees is implementing SBIRT uh, within community-based behavior, community behavioral health organizations at this point, and I don't know what the uh, end questioner uh, is dig really wants to dig into, but at this point the data, quote unquote, outcomes data as well as implementation data has not come in yet. They are in their early stages and probably six to eight months in the implementation process, but that data will be forthcoming. And, I'm kind of setting the tone for my entire <laughs> presentation of data forthcoming in the future. So I, I would request stay tuned a bit. Sure. And then here's our second question. Um, and there, it's a little bit long, so I'm going to read through the whole thing here. Uh, we often hear expert bridges prevention and treatment. In a youth setting, very few people will need treatment. In fact, mental health professionals have raised concerns with us that youth will inappropriately be referred to treatment through SBIRT. Given that most youth won't be referred to treatment, isn't it more appropriate to emphasize SBIRT as prevention? In our current funding world, all money is divided into prevention dollars or treatment dollars. I, I think the foundation um, and the broader field do see this as uh, prevention activity. I mean, there is pre prevention tenants within SBIRT as well as there is, you know, brief assessment or brief um, treatment and, you know, that's what, you know, brief um, interviews are as a, an assessment and, you know, a little bit of a treatment. Um, I don't think that it's the role of us at this point to say, like, SBIRT is prevention, but the foundation has seen it as a, as a prevention type of activity and early intervention. Um, there is you know, while there isn't, there will not be a huge number to be identified as being referred to treatment, there is still this opportunity to meet um, and assess and conduct universal screening and um, identify those individuals that may need um, some initial assistance or initial guidance uh, that will so, that will help them so they won't actually need treatment and to stop them or stop the actions that they're taking in the past, in their past. Okay, thank you. It looks like we have Alexa back on. Uh, Alexa, can you hear us? I can. Thank okay, you. Great. Um, and again, apologies and thanks everyone for rolling with us. <laughs> Don't know what's going on with uh, Verizon, but we will keep moving. Um, so as I was saying, you know, it's, uh, looking at uh, you know a, a range of settings for um, for doing this work. Uh, next slide. Uh, so here, just an example of some of the partners that we're working with. Um, and again, you know, I think trying to think of across not just the different systems and settings that are used, but um, thinking about accessibility. So not just funding, as I mentioned, training and implementation, but also looking at issues around policy as well, and really thinking about how we can, um, uh, you know, how that as uh, part of the work that we're doing with groups like the American Academy of Pediatrics and the work that we do, um, working with Community Catalyst and Legal Action Center around advocacy issues. Um, you know, across the board, I think, are um, trying to hit important points that are important to the work that we're doing. And of course, since all of this is the hearing evaluation and learning work that we do as part of each of our strategic initiatives. And as you've heard already, 
app is uh, the lead on that and the organization that we're partnering with on that. And you know, I think the evaluation and learning process is essential and critical to the work that we do in terms of really wanting to make sure that it is responsive to not just what we're learning as part of our investments, but also responsive to the broader learning that's happening in the field. Um, it seems like every uh, week there is a new uh, you know, research article around uh, screening, intervention, brief intervention, some aspect of this work as it relates to adolescents. And so you know, I think critical that we're uh, doing as much as we can to keep abreast of the uh, emerging information that's, that's coming out from uh, from the field around best practices and uh, uh, work as it relates to this particular um, initiative. Uh, next page. And then finally, before I turn it over to Corey, uh, you know, as she was just emphasizing, I think we are very on early on in the initiative, and so are two years in, um, and so most of our projects, even the ones that are more advanced. Um, are really only a year in, and so we're just beginning to collect um, in some of the sites that are more implementation-oriented uh, data and um, other important lessons learned. Um, but even though we're early on, I think we have heard some pretty um, interesting messages and, and uh, opportunities that exist um, across the across the board. And wanted to just spend a minute talking about each of those before I transition over to Corey. Um, so the the work, you know, I think that needs to be done on you know, I think educating the broader fields that touch this issue about the impact of early use. I think there's still um, very many people that believe that, um, you know, all youth use alcohol and drugs and it's not a big deal or it's a rite of passage. And, um, you know, I think that how we can uh, do a better job of talking about what we know about the impact that early youth has, um, particularly in combination with other challenges or issues that a young person may have. Um, really an opportunity to focus on risk and use and early intervention. I caught the tail end of the last question in terms of their S for fit um, and, and not wanting to make sure that kids get uh, inappropriately referred to treatment and that S for it doesn't have the networking effect. I think we're very conscious of all that. Um, and uh, you know, I think working very hard to make sure that at the end of the day, this is about creating a continuum so that kids aren't getting essentially all the things, I mean, which is nothing or treatment, and there's nothing in between. And so, you know, I hope this is an, an opportunity for us to really think about how we, uh, how and what we do to better address risky use um, through an early intervention context. Um, as I was mentioning, you know, really thinking about how we reach not just um, care practitioners, um, but how do we also engage, uh, you know, other youth-serving uh, practitioners, I guess I'll say, because they mentioned, you know, community-based organizations that may be working with young people, mental health practitioners, uh, juvenile justice practitioners, you know, where are the opportunities to really move upstream um, and catch young people um, as early as possible? Uh, again, as I mentioned, you know, again, this opportunity to really think about the entire continuum. And um, while our work is, you know, very focused on, you know, I think the, the prevention and early intervention work, you know, need to also, of course, um, understand the lack of capacity that exists there across the board for adolescent services and the real barrier that um, the, the shortage of adolescent treatment services provides to, to wanting to do screening in the first place. I think that's something we hear very often. So again, really thinking about how does this um, expert framework really provide an opportunity to look across the board at the adolescent services that, that are there and aren't there. I think really think about strategies to, to build them out. Um, and then finally, as I mentioned, you know, really hoping at the end of the day, sort of one of the, the end games is really getting substance use which best as part of routine adolescent care um, and making sure that, you know, as I mentioned, this uh, should be part of the packet of things um, and um, health needs that, uh, in particular, healthcare practitioners are talking to young people about. Um, and with that, I think that is my last slide. I will turn it over to Corey, and hopefully her phone works. <laughs> okay, Corey, um, I'm just questions, I guess, if you, or if you took some questions, I'm happy to do whatever. Uh, we do have one question here. Uh, with our kids, they are mostly using or at high risk. How does SBIRT impact treatment, and when has that treatment begun? 
so you know, I'm, it's hard to say without the setting, but I think the idea of effort is identifying kids non-treatment settings that may fall across the continuum. And so um, if you're starting at a point of kids that are already treatment seeking, it sounds like, then um, you know, obviously you would have the normal processes in place of, I don't know if you need the screening as much per se, but making sure you have a good assessment in place and that assessment is driving sort of the services that are provided. And I'm not sure if that's answering the question or not. But. Alex, I wanted to clarify that's in regards to kids in the juvenile justice system. Oh, so, you know, I think that, um, you know, it's an opportunity to get them the treatment they need. And at, the un at the end of the day, I think really understanding what the range of you know, especially for young people in the justice system, that substance use is probably one of many um, needs that they have. And so really making sure you have a really solid screening assessment and then, you know, referral in place um, and that it's not just about, you know, what's going on with the substance use, but that you should you know, sort of comprehensive that are available. Um, and I think the justice system is a perfect example of where we need more uh, more interventions in that over range. Um, I think a lot of kids get inappropriately placed on higher levels of care um, that may not belong because there's nothing else in the community. And I think a really important opportunity to shine a light on um, the needs that young people are and really thinking about are our system responding to those needs, and if not, how do we make sure that they do? Okay, great. Thank you. Corey, I'm going to pass the slides to you. Good afternoon, um, East Coast people, um, and good morning to those in different time zones. I wanted to thank the National Oscar for ATTC, IRETA, and the Hilton Foundation for inviting me to talk today. Um, there are two stages of my presentation. One, I want to present the evaluation as a critical component of the Hilton Foundation's Youth Substance Use Prevention and Early Intervention Strategic Initiative, and then we'll dig a little bit into the implementation grantees funded through the initiative. So in 2014, APT Associates was selected as the Hilton, Fonti Hilton Foundation's monitoring, evaluation, and learning partner for its youth substance use prevention and early intervention strategic initiative. Um, this grant to APT represents an important opportunity for the foundation and the field, which we'll discuss over the next several slides. The APT Associates project is led by Dr. Dana Hunt as its principal investigator. I'm the project director, and Lee Fisher, formerly of Colorado Espert, is the lead for grantee engagement. Data analysts and site liaisons work to make sense of the data we collect and, and to work collaboratively with the foundation's grantees to identify and gather data. Also, we have Ed and Judith Bernstein of the Beinart Institute who provides ongoing guidance and expertise to our project. So let's discuss some specifics of the evaluation project and how it informs and impacts the initiative in the broader field. So as Alexa previewed, uh, the Foundation's five-year use substance use prevention and early intervention strategy has three primary goals. To increase providers' knowledge and skills, expand implementation of early intervention services for youth, and strengthen the evidence base and foster learning. Through this initiative, the Foundation has funded diverse grantees with programs designed to move the needle in the training, delivery, and evaluation of youth-related substance use prevention and early intervention activities, particularly through the use of SBIRT. APT as its evaluation partner is responsible for creating and implementing a collaborative monitoring evaluation and learning process to monitor grantee progress, produce actionable data for the foundation and grantees to use, improve delivery systems, and expand local evaluation cap capacity and capabilities, and promote sustainability of the intervention as well as programs. The MEL project allows the foundation the opportunity to respond to findings, re-strategize funding activities, and restructure goals and objectives. So 
this, the evaluation has created a theory of change for the entire initiative, which is presented on this slide. The theory of change identifies the major activities being conducted by grantees, which map to the foundation's three major initiatives, which is shown on the far left side of this slide. Then the theory of change identifies the short-term goals and outcomes leading to the broader impact of the initiative to increase the health and well-being of young people through early identification, prevention, and treatment of behavioral health problems. In order for the impact to occur, this long-term impact to occur, the short-term goals and outcomes must also be achieved. So our project approach is designed to map the characteristics of programs and progress of grantees to this theory of change to move the field forward and impact the health and well-being of youth across communities served through the foundation's grantees as well as the broader nation. A logic model was also developed, but not shown here. And it's really small font. You <laughs> so. Um, as discussed a little earlier, our project has three major components to monitor grantee progress, evaluate the success in reaching the initiative's objectives and goals, and learn learning and building capacity of grantees in the larger field. We'll talk about each of these in turn. The monitoring grantee progress is primarily done through the utilization of the RE-AIM framework. RE-AIM stands for Reach, Effectiveness, Adoption, Implementation, and Maintenance. It was developed by Russell Glasgow and colleagues at the National Cancer Institute and has been used as a process and implementation evaluation framework in the health and other social services fields. It quote unquote unpacks the components of program into measurable pieces of implementation. So let's take each of these. Reach, R. <laughs> this measures to what extent did the grantee's approach reach the intended target. E, effectiveness. To what extent did the approach effectively meet its goals. A, adoption. To what extent did the approach engage the targeted audiences it's intended to do into its adoption of the program? I, implementation, to what extent did the approach implement as it was supposed to be planned? And M, maintenance, the, how did the um, grantee or program sustain activities post-funding? The app team, uh, an evaluation of success in, re in reaching the initiative objectives is measured through specific research questions and the creation and capturing of data of common measures of cross grantees that map to the objective goals. The app team works in collaboratively with the grantees and the foundation to create individual re-aim metrics so that, they that the grantees report on a quarterly basis. Additionally, they have these common measures across you know, grantees that they report on a quarterly basis, so an ongoing data collection activity. Um, as what is critically important to underscore is that APT is not the local evaluator for each of the grantees. Most have this expertise as part of their own team. We are responsible for measuring the progress to the foundation's goals while expanding local evaluation capacity and broader field impact to improve prevention, early intervention services, and the systems serving youth. And we do this through um, building the capacity. And capacity we're defining as topic capacity, so expertise on a specific topic area or content, as well as evaluation capacity. These activities that we in engage in are this online collaborative community that we've built um, for and with grantees, meetings and convenings, and periodic review of grantees' progress through conference calls, webinars, and briefs. So our evaluation approach was founded on engaging all parties throughout the entire evaluation. It is not a traditional evaluation where you come in at the beginning and, and come in at the end and see the change that has occurred over the course of the, of the several years. Um, the way that the grantees have been funded is, is on this ongoing basis, that grantees come in um, on a quarterly basis, come into the evaluation, as well as are being funded by the, uh, by the initiative. So key tenants are of our um, integrated and engaging approach are that both process and outcome data are needed to inform expert training, implementation, and practice. It's critical to provide timely, focused feedback on progress for the grantees and the foundation to target assistance and identify and implement mid-course corrections. And the evaluation tar tailors evaluation indicators to reflect both grantee and foundation goals and models. Our approach really provides an avenue for this continuous knowledge and collaborative learning to increase grantee participation and initiative effectiveness. So, and, and as well as the actively engaged youth and health providers to inform the validity of all aspects of the evaluation. So I can stop there, uh, Sarah, if there are any questions, and then I'll move on to the second part of the conversation. Sure. I do have one question. Uh, when expert is implemented in mental health settings, does the additional time 
available and opportunity for multiple sessions impact the SBIRT model used? So um, I'm going to punt that or put it aside um, just to t until I talk about the SBIRT implementation and the use serving continuum. I think that that will be something that um, we may get to, and if not, I'll make sure to answer it um, after the next part of the session. Is that okay? Yep, that's great. Okay. All right, so moving on to the next part. So we've, we've set the stage of why uh, evaluation is, why the foundation has um, engaged with APT to conduct these evaluation activities and set the framework of what our approach really looks like. So I wanted to dig in um, to those grantees that the foundation has funded, um, particularly that are doing expert implementation in the youth serving continuum. So the foundation has funded grantees across the spectrum of systems change, training and info dissemination, implementation, um, and the capturing and the promoting of the evidence base. So in this next part, I'll focus on the 15 grantees that are working in 35 states that are or will be implementing screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment activities or expert-like activities. <clears throat> Excuse me. The foundation focused um, its funding uh, to diverse settings to cast a wide net to catch youth and young adults where they are, both in location setting and the continuum. So the settings that they've funded are schools, healthcare, community-based juvenile justice. 420 organizations in these general settings are implementing or will be implementing expert or expert-like activities. However, even within a specific type or specific setting, there is diversity in its characteristics. I mean, take, for example, the healthcare, um, the grouping in the healthcare. That includes hospitals and pediatrics and primary care and community behavioral health. And not all primary care practices are the same. There is extreme diversity in the type of primary care, or the, the type of service being delivered in a primary care setting. So these different settings and models of care delivery are and will be, as the evaluation unfolds, extremely insightful into the characteristics of youth being served. So who goes there? Who goes to each of these different settings? What is their level of risk, or what is their level of assessment? By which types, and who's serving them in those? What kind of professionals are being served, or are serving the, the kids in those settings? And which models of care are being are being delivered? So as the webinar audience knows, SBIRT is not a vaccine in the sense that it is that it isn't a one-shot deal designed to ward off potential illnesses. SBIRT in its truest form is a comprehensive model for screening and early intervention and referral to treatment. But breaking down the components of SBIRT, screening, brief intervention, referral to treatment, and effectively implementing these components requires training and skills building activities. For the model to work and be effective, providers, professionals, policymakers, kids, parents, need to be trained and awareness raised on, the inter on this intervention and, oven on and other evidence-based and promising practices designed to improve the health and well-being of youth. The implementation grantees funded by the, the foundation recognize this need across the different sectors and different settings and have created training and technical assistance materials to help to, to expand knowledge and build skills and improve care delivery. So these include, and I'm going to go into them a little bit, um, general expert one-on-one, -on -one, so either virtual and in person. And this could be provided to frontline front line and support staff, parents, and policymakers. Another type of training approach is an intensive in-person skill-based training um, for people who would likely implement expert. Um, this includes practice and role-playing activities, which are particularly important um, for that defining and implementation of the BI, the brief intervention part of the expert uh, model. Um, interactive web-based trainings for students and professionals as a continuing education credit or as ongoing knowledge and skills improvement as one progresses through their professional career. Additionally, on ongoing boosters, grand rounds, case studies with, expert with experts in the youth expert implementation and through other technical assistance assessments and quality improvement activities. So you might be asking, what are the kinds of models being implemented, the kind of expert models being implemented by the grantees? So I want to underscore that the models are really diverse. Similar to the settings highlighted earlier, grantees have developed various diverse approaches that incorporate the spirit and components of, of expert. 
part of the evaluation plan, and it's a little bit to come in the future, is to identify these components and approaches that are most promising and effective for care delivery, increasing access to capacity, and impacting the health and well-being of youth. So going back to the theory of change. Some of the models being implemented are using a web-based tool to conduct expert in school health settings. Engaging parents in health and school settings through an innovative expert model that has three, four, or four sessions of brief intervention and includes the parent. Uh, implementing a modified expert protocol to provide care to youth with chronic medical conditions. Creating and implementing a four session mentor model using peers in recovery. Referring on or off site to a behavioral health condition clinician who is actually the one that delivers the brief intervention if necessary, and, and, and if necessary, the referral to treatment. <clears throat> Excuse me. The evaluation will, will further uncover and unpack these diverse models of expert being implemented and the 420 organizations served by the foundation's grantees. So I think this gets a little bit back to the question that was asked earlier of when expert is implemented in mental health settings, does the additional time available and the opportunity for multiple sessions impact the expert model used? Um, the foundation's grantees that are implementing SBIRT have defined models based on what the setting all is. They're using the components of SBIRT and are, and are proactively, um, proactively creating what that model is um, with, to, that, that, that best serves that population as well as best serves the professionals and time within that population. However, I do want to underscore that, that, a lot, that many of the grantees, similar to the evaluation pro approach, are making mid-course corrections. That if there is, the program is not being as successful uh, in referring to treatment, they're changing their, their approach to perhaps make it so the next cohort or the next activities that are being implemented is, is better and it might be more um, open to that engagement with the treatment activity. Um, and I think that the foundation has really invested a lot of this effort and resources to uncover what might work because we're at a point within this field that there just is not a lot of um, knowledge, evidence, and activities that occur around youth expert implementation. Um, so we're providing and creating that information through, as we go through this project. So outcomes, uh, as part of any evaluation, outcomes is critically important. Um, this slide provides a quick snapshot of the outcomes we'll be able to capture across grantees. Um, so quality measures, number of screens, brief interventions, and referral to treatment. For those grantees conducting follow-up, because as, as a reminder, we are not the local evaluator, um, that, but so for those grantees that are already conducting follow-up as part of their project, the delay in initiation and de decreased use of substances. The impact of different models of care on this delay in initiation, as well as on the implementation of SBIRT. Um, the increase of expert implementation insights, and then sustainability of the program. As our project has just started last year, and grantees, as, as Alexa have noted, had just recently started implementing in the last nine months, nine months to a year, there will be more to come on this in the next couple of years. So I used this term bef before, but stay tuned for <laughs> additional data to come um, in, the, in the near future. So I wanted to end the presentation and the webinar discussing a couple of early successes and challenges found across the foundation's grantees as they planned and, and did early implementation. So let's start a little bit with the success, which can also be coined as lessons learned or key or critical factors for planning and implementation of this type of program. So a couple of things that I want to pull out is this, um, the one of the early successes was the gaining provider buy-in early in the process. This was seen as critical for an effective implementation, um, providing training and technical assistance as well as ongoing booster training opportunities um, to a variety of different staff. Performing this multiple walkthroughs of client and patient flow prior to going live, this allows for staff and allows for um, the healthcare practices as well as other types of practices the early identification or the possibility that an issue might arise in like a potential handoff or the screening results not being pushed to the to the person in the right time frame. Um, and then this utilize this one I thought was really um, interesting, this utilization of providers where their skills are most applicable. So for this like in some of the uh, grants that we've looked at at the early stages, like medical assistants and receptionists give the screens, but then they pass that information to the physicians and behavioral 
behavioralist who will review the results and, if possible or necessary, provide the brief interventions. So they review the results with the, with the youth, but they, they're not the ones that actually conduct the screening. So and now some of the challenges and mitigation approaches. And again, I'll pull out a couple from the list above. So competing priorities and philosophies between managers and staff. Limited comfort providing brief interventions, and then turnover among expert trained providers and staff. So as you can see, some of those challenges that I just brought up can actually be mitigated by some of the successes or lessons learned of the other programs discussed in the previous slide. So I think this just highlights the opportunity, and it underscores the importance of this cross-grantee and cross-evaluation team to grantee learning, problem solving, and process improvement. So our evaluation approach was built on creating collaborative partnerships with the foundation and the foundation's grantees. And this approach allows us, the foundation, and its grantees to capture quality data, identify and mitigate issues as they arise, and strategically plan and implement, plan and implement prevention and early intervention programs that are designed to improve the health and well-being of our youth. Over the next couple of years, we're going to conduct several activities um, around the grantee engagement. We're going to do um, a webinar series and create some affinity groups that are specific. The affinity groups will be specific to our grantees, but the webinars uh, likely will um, work in collaboration with the broader field and invite that participation. Data collection and analysis, and this is just both quali qualitative. Um, qual you know, key informant interviews, as well as quantitative, our quarterly reporting, and an expert implementation rubric, like what is actually unpacking that expert approaches at each of these different programs and in each of these different settings. And then dissemination of findings through webinars and conferences. Um, this has been, this past year has been a really great opportunity for the app team um, to grow and to learn a lot more about this, as well as to work like I said, very collaboratively with, with grantees that are setting the stage and pushing the needle, again, um, to improve the services being delivered, expand capacity of healthcare providers, as well as other providers serving youth in very diverse settings. So thank you. OK, thanks, Corey. Um, at this time, I'm going to unmute both Corey and Alexa. We can go through some of our questions. Great, thanks. The other thing I wanted to add really quickly um, as Corey wrapped up was that in terms of another next step is that we do a public evaluation report that's released to the field every year. And so I think it's you know, really important to us to be as transparent as possible. Um, and so in the next few months, we will, will be releasing um, the year one findings from the report. So I just want to urge everyone to keep an eye out for that. Okay, so our first question is actually more of a comment that um, you are welcome to speak to. Uh, the comment is that we uh, find that school nurses are sometimes concerned about taking on SBIRT because treatment resources in our community are so limited. Uh, do either of you have a response to that? I mean, I think this is Alexa. That's you know a challenge across the board, whether you're talking a school nurse or a regular pediatric provider. Um, and so I think that it is a huge issue because at the end of the day, um, we haven't had the investment in adolescent services that we need. And so I think on some level, there's a hope that, um, you know, by trying to strengthen the, the screening approaches, that we'll have a, more of a case to make need to invest in adolescent services. But in the meantime, really thinking about, you know, how we do a better job of identifying who that pool of providers is. So for example, um, the work that the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation has been doing in partnership with the state and some of their local providers sort of underwent the process of identifying not just the existing providers in the public system, but also tapping into sort of your individual solo practitioners that may be um, interested and willing to, to work with young people. And by doing that, they you know found capacity that prior um, to that they hadn't realized was there. And so I think there are ways to really think about from a um, community perspective and working in conjunction with the state and, and some of those other actors, we really um, uh, you know have an opportunity to shine the light on identifying services and, and talking about what need is there. Great. Um, our next question is, the yeah. age range, yes? Oh, would you mind if I said just one thing? Not at all. Go ahead. 
Okay. Uh, the, uh, the other piece that I would add is uh, Alexa talked about it very appropriately at the systems and services level, but I, I want us to think about like who is actually going to get the screenings. And these kids, I mean, they, as somebody talked about a little or asked the question about a little earlier, is most will actually not screen as positive or screen as severe, but it will give them an opportunity um, to start conversations and to start that discussion with kids about substance use. So um, obviously, like having an assessment of treatment activities and services in your community is a critical component of any type of intervention around referring to treatment for those kids that are necessary. But it really gives you this opportunity. Screening and early intervention, brief intervention, gives you an opportunity to meet kids earlier, perhaps, and earlier in their age, as well as in potentially their youth. So they won't actually need that referral to treatment at a later date. Okay, um, and here's our next question. Uh, the age range you are targeting is 15 to 22. Could you talk about why you're using that specific age range um, and why perhaps not a wider range given that substance use initiation can start earlier? This is Alexa. Um, so, you know, as I mentioned, those were, uh, you know, I guess I'll say some initial parameters that the board identified when they were thinking about how best to um, you know, really have some work that was targeted um, to, you know, I think sort of a, a big enough population to have a difference, but not so big that, you know, with our resources we can't take it all on. And and so I think um, that was part of the question. I well, sort of the acceleration and use that happens um, in general, you know, between the ages of 14, 15, and 18. I think uh, was seen as another again, very strategic opportunity to look at what's happening, uh, you know, between ninth and 12th grade around alcohol, drug use, marijuana, and other use. And so I think that's another thing. Um, I will add, though, you know, those are um, in practice, obviously, parameters that have been relaxed. And so um, a number of the implementation projects that we're doing are looking at a broader population, so are going down to uh, 12, 13. You know, I think the pediatricians recommend that you start at age 11. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think in terms of at least the younger, um, uh, going a little bit younger, some of that is happening just to respond to the realities of the, the settings that we're working in. Corey, did you want to respond as well? Uh, no, thanks. Okay, I'm going to move on to our next question then. Uh, you've talked about the various settings in which the grantees are working. What are the most common barriers being reported across them? Yeah, so I, I touched a, a little bit about this when I talked about challenges. Um, and um, I think the, the ones that I didn't like specifically pull out on, if you look at the different settings that are being implemented, um, it is like I'm try, I try to look at common commonalities. So, what have been some of the commonalities? And I don't know if the question, um, the person asking the question, was interested in a very specific setting. Um, but what we're finding is, um, at the end of the day, I think you need to have a really great planned approach. However, you have to be willing to roll with the punches, so to speak. And as different things um, come up and as changes within protocols or an EHR takes it takes way too long to modify an EHR to add the questions or you're still using paper records and you have to identify different cues and you may have be doing your assessment or your, I mean your screen sorry um, your screen on paper cues and then that piece of paper has to be entered I mean I think that that like the patient flow what that looks like getting the technology in place um, and then um, a lot of it has to do with attitudes and behaviors around what expert is and what expert isn't, as well as this, um, and we touched about it a little earlier in a different type of question, but where do people go when they, when they do that, need that referral? Or that, that belief that, um, that if you don't have things or relationships um, and partnerships within the community, that you can't create those relationships within the community if, if, if you need that referral to treatment. Um, a lot of it is a knowledge and awareness, and then the, the buy-in piece as well. Okay, 
Um, our next question is, you mentioned interfacing with EHR vendors. Which EHRs are using and in what settings are they uh, using this? And are they attempting to bill or get reimbursed? And have any of them been successful in getting paid? So that is a very specific question that I am <laughs> not, <laughs> um, I do not have the knowledge at this point to answer. Um, I would have to. It's pretty representative in terms of the types of vendors. It's pretty representative. Yeah. The yeah. major <laughs> Yeah, I think that the the piece about the whole reimbursement, I just I um I don't I don't know um at this point. Not to say we're we're looking into developing um, a particular line of inquiry around EHRs. Um, so I would again say stay tuned for that. And that's a really great question that we'll add to the assessment. Great. Okay, the next question is, are any of the grantees serving special populations, like minority youth specifically, or LGBTQ youth, or young adults um, 18 to 22 serving in the military? Uh, so very specific populations. There are um, some uh, of the grantees are working with at risk, very at risk. Um, and within those grantees, they might be serving um, a specific community that has a higher percentage of um, a minor ethnic minority or a military population. Um, there are also um, another specific grantee that's working within a school, and that's those schools that they will that they are going to work in are um, those that have um, academic challenges. So I think that there are definitely grantees that are working um, across the like setting type as well as across types of, of youth or characteristics of youth. Okay, our next question is in regards to a previous question um, that was talking about the juvenile justice system. Um, so the, the comment is, you're saying that screening followed by a brief intervention and referral to treatment. Um, they already screen every client coming into the juvenile justice setting. And this differentiates who gets a five-week or 10-week group. Is this the brief intervention and referrals that come after release? So uh, I'm not sure the best way to respond to that. I mean, I'm not sure if they're describing to me what sounds like a continuum of care. To me, that doesn't sound like an expert intervention. Um, and it's equally important. And I think, of course, if you are providing um, those services and you identify that that young person needs more services once they're no longer part of the or under supervision of the juvenile justice system, then then absolutely there should be research, you know, referral to you know not just substance use, mental health, but again the other uh, supports that young people need to be successful. And so you know I think uh, it sounds like sort of what they're doing probably fits more in that brief treatment piece of expert, which you know I think is something that's that's uh, sort of developing more and more as we think about how we respond to young people that are, you know, I think for closer to the end of the, you know, the the continuum that needs treatment that doesn't belong in maybe intensive treatment services for a five or ten week intervention may be appropriate. Um, and again, I think that's just sort of a, a clinical judgment call in terms of whether that, that young person still needs um, additional services. Uh, post sort of that they're getting through the juvenile justice system, and a lot of them probably do. But that should be driven by, you know, assessment. Okay, great. Um, our next question is, what expert frameworks are being implemented? Are they all implementing BNIA or the NIAAA Youth Guide approach? And what model seems to be the most promising in your sites? So I um, would say that we did not dictate that and then not have, you know, prescribed uh, what grantees are incorporated in their brief and some are using the BNI, some are using this more traditional interviewing approaches, um, bringing in sort of other components like CBT or CBT oriented work that so, you know, I think that so that piece um, early to tell, um, you know, where what approaches are more successful, and, and they're in such different settings. I don't know if we'll ever be able to say, you know, across settings, 
what the you know quote unquote most effective approach is. It, you know, it may end up really depending on the individual characteristics to some extent. Yeah, and I think that's one of the the, the it highlights why the found, the foundation's approach to funding these uh, the programs um, right now there are you know NIAAA is very specifically related to youth and BNI has uh, promised um, within the BNIA or BNI adolescent framework I think that that's like this value and it shows that there's you know there's not just one way to do it that there are multiple ways to actively engage kids and meet them with they where they are and what with with what their situation is. I mean, similarly, the, the foundation did not dictate you have to use this screen. And I think, again, that that provides us with a, a really great um, idea and standing for the, the diversity and what the diversity shows within these all of these different populations and settings. OK, um, our next question is, given how diverse the sites are, uh, what are the common measures all sites are using to help Hilton determine if they have achieved their goals? So within each of the foundation's goals, um, the foundation has you know, the three major objectives, and within each of those there are goals that um, we've identified and worked with the individual grantees if they're conducting activities that, help, that provide data to those uh, objective goals. So for example, as I wrote in the outcomes. Um, so for those that are implementation grantees looking at, you know, the number of screens and the types of screens that are being conducted, the number of brief interventions or for all the treatment, the number of um, activities that are positively respond to a, a positive screen or what, what's the what's the response to a screen. Um, and there's obviously qualitative data and quantitative data within each of the objective measures. Um, I think what's most critically important is to understand that only grantees that are doing something that relates to that objective will, will be reporting on data that is respective or that gives us that information for that objective. Um, for the training measure, I mean, there is information regarding the types of trainings, the, the different modes of training, what those different modes of training look like, um, how are people being trained, and in different, um, who are they being trained by, um, as well as just the, the dissemination of the knowledge to a broader pub public, so presentations and uh, webinars and participation and changing of knowledge um, is critically important for that objective as well. Okay, great. And here's our next question. Uh, we often hear that we need more ways to interface with patients that don't require staff. Are any sites using technology such as apps or tablets to deliver screening or the BI, or is technology being used in other ways? It is. Uh, so we have um, at least one that's rising to the top of my head, um, sort of project that's looking at a computerized screening and brief intervention protocol. Um, and you know, the hope again is that that um, that will sort of help us get smarter about you know the role that technology plays. You know, it has its own set of issues, but um, you know, I think clearly there's a lot of interest there. Um, in terms of the the role that it can play, and I think that the technology piece is is an ongoing conversation um, in terms of you know the range of things that's happening out there, and um, you know again what sort of how the foundation can play a role in um, identifying a few things that um, that might have an impact. And so that's I would say to some extent sort of a stay tuned conversation, but definitely something that that we're interested in. And, and then to piggyback as well, um, uh, I would say there's quite a few of the uh, end organizations, so the organizations that are implementing SBIRT that are utilizing a tablet or utilizing a portal or an app to develop or to conduct the screening, like the screening part. Um, so the utilization of technology as part of the screening um, is, is something that a lot of grantees are looking at or are utilizing. Okay, and are there any resources or materials being developed by Hilton or the grantees that will be made available uh, or be in the public domain? Yeah, absolutely. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, I think it's um, one of the important philosophies of the way we approach the work that 
that while it is important that obviously we're supporting the work that grantees are doing and making sure there's opportunities for them to collaborate, that um, this really is about the broader stakeholder community and sort of how we use um, our investments as an opportunity to leverage sort of the broader um, resources that are out there via the feds and, and other agencies um, and really make sure that this is a conversation that happens in the broader stakeholder community. And so, um, you know, all our strategy documents are online, sort of the narrative of how we got to where we're at with the, you know, focus on expert or on our web page. And, you know, I think we're t continuously, um, again, as, as more and more of the projects get up and running and have white papers and um, findings and lessons learned and that sort of thing, that will all be posted on our website. You can follow me on Twitter. I'm always tweeting stuff out. <laughs> so um, really do, you know, um, want to be engaged with, uh, you know, broader stakeholder community on the on this learning piece. So um, absolutely ways to, to share resources. Yeah, and, and again, I think that a lot of the grantees are disseminating materials as well, and um, particularly around the implementation. I know that the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation, through the Center for Excellence up here in New Hampshire, um, has a playbook, a New Hampshire uh, expert implementation playbook. That's that I know that they're revising. Um, but it is posted on their website, so I think you could probably search for that. I think that is a really useful tool, and I think that other grantees, as they get up and running further into the implementation and they're adapting their materials or modifying it based on their experiences, there will be, I think there will be a deluge and additional resources out there. Yeah, and maybe there's a way, you know, I think the other thing I want to say is, is I, I think there's more out there than people realize even at this point. And so I don't know if there's even a role for the expert ATTC. I know that, that sponsoring this webinar has um, really been making a concerted effort to roll out the resources that um, are being made available through the broader research community and practice field. And, and you know, as I mentioned earlier, just in the last you know, two years that the foundation has been doing this work, I think a number of of um, helpful resources have, have come out, and so um, hopefully there might be a way to um, highlight those in particular for the people that are on the webinar today. Okay, great. We have uh, two more questions on here. Um, what screening tools would you recommend for youth? Do you want to um, right now, oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, right now the one, the two that are most um, that are being used by the most grantees at this point, um, and I, I want to caveat that because actually there are several grantees that have created their own screening tools or integrated screening questions um, around substance use into other screening tools that they have um, that you know assess on other mental health issues as well as well-being, environment. Um, trauma, um, but the two most commonly used at this point that I can recall and uh, that I know of are the CRAFT as well as the S2BI, so Screening to Grief Intervention for Kids. Okay, and then here's our uh, last question. Um, how could we learn more about the different grantee projects? So you can um, go on our website. That's probably the best place to start. Um, there's a, a comprehensive list of the grantees, a little bit of description about their work. Um, and then probably you know, we can always take questions through the website or really encourage people to follow up directly with the organizations that are listed um, to talk to them about their work. And they're probably, honestly, the best source of information about um, the projects that they're working on. And we will share the link to the website in the follow-up emails. Um, Alexa, I just have one more question for you from one of the attendees. They were asking for your Twitter handle because they can't find you. You should if you just type in my, I think it's just at Alexa Eggleston. It should just come up. And I'm trying to build my follower base, so please join. <laughs> <laughs> Help me get to 1,000. <laughs> Okay, well, if there's no other questions at this time, we're going to wrap things up. If anyone does have any additional questions following the webinar, they can feel free to submit them to us via email at info at iretta.org. Um, I want to thank everyone for all of their great, great questions, and I want to thank the speakers for such a great webinar. At this time, I'd like to go over our evaluation and CEU instructions. You're going to receive a few emails from us following this webinar. In these emails will be a link to the recording of the webinar as well as a PDF version of today's slides.
Also included in the email is a link to the evaluation. Our grant evaluators are required and pleased to collect feedback from, from all event participants. Completion of this evaluation is critical to maintaining our funding and continuing to provide quality education and materials. Your participation is appreciated and the evaluation should take no more than two minutes of your time. Immediately following the evaluation is a request form for a certificate of attendance or a NADAC and or PCB CEUs. So should you choose to skip the evaluation and proceed directly to the CEU request, simply leave all of the answers blank in the evaluation. Again, we just want to thank everyone for their participation today, and if you have any further questions, feel free to email us at info at IRETA.org. Okay, thank you, Alexa and Corey. We're going to wrap things up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye.